afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on voice and public speaking. Um, my name is Susan Smith, and I'm head of operations here at Alder. And I'm also going to be your host for the next 45 minutes for this seminar. And we have planned quite a fun session for you. Uh, we've just had Blue Monday. So this, I hope, will set your weekend or put your weekend in a better course. We've got some really fun exercises, uh, which we'd love you to join in with. Uh, I hope that you are somewhere where you might be in a bit of a private space and therefore won't feel too silly joining along. But if you're not, don't worry, because we have actually recorded the session also. So if you do want to, after seeing the webinar, go away and practice for yourself. No worries. Just request the video for us and then uh, we can send it out to you. So why voice and public speaking? Well, it's such an integral part of crisis communications. Um, and of course, that is Alder's uh, bread and butter. We are crisis communications consultancy and we work with um, a range of clients, mostly hailing from the public sector be that education, be that healthcare, or charities, but also corporates too. And all of those clients pretty much have one thing in common, that they really want help navigating their communications when faced with quite hostile stakeholders. So uh, that uh, is, is what we noticed is actually people are really wanting to be prepared in these situations. We've had quite a significant uptick in clients asking us for training. Uh, and uh, whether that's kind of scenario planning, because there's a, a, a you know a risk that they could potentially have in, in in the very near future, or whether that's actually in the moment of a crisis. And whilst we can completely compare everybody to have the right messages to hand, that's only half of the delivery, really, of the successful delivery of a crisis communication. The other half of it is how you deliver it, and that is what we're going to be focusing on today. So I'm delighted to welcome Alet, who is our latest consultant at Alder, very new. This is first, first airing for Alet and Alder. Um, and uh, Alet is actually going to take us through how we deliver that communications message perfectly. Alet, welcome. Please, please give us a little bit of an introduction to yourself and all of the leaders and, and the types of people that you've been coaching uh, in, in your past. Thank you very much, Susan. Welcome, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here. So I trained as an actor at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. Um, I've worked extensively as an actor and as a theatre director before moving on to become a, a voice coach and acting coach at drama schools across the UK and internationally. Uh, I've been invited back to Guildhall, where I trained to work on their BA acting course, as well as working for Guildhall Ignite, which does this type of work, working with people in business uh, to enhance their ability to communicate clearly and give them skills required for public speaking. I also work at a drama center, uh, arts educational, and a little further afield in Florida State University. And what people like me are doing is drawing upon that vast body of work that we've cultivated in training actors and applying them to public speaking, because really it's the same thing. How do I appear real in a surreal circumstance? <laughs> Well, given that incredible kind of workload that you have, absolutely thrilled that you are now a resource for us to tap into. Um, so let's get the session underway. So Alid, um, public speaking, it's something that we are all a little fearful of, but actually is an inherent part of leadership. So you're gonna help us re remove that layer of fear, right? So tell us, what would you do then in the, we've got one hour, we're about to go out, there's a, a as, as we've said, the stars and stakeholders, be that kind of, you know, a board of governors or be that a body of media. How should we prepare in that last hour? What should we be thinking about and doing? Uh, I think the answer to that question is as unique and individual as the individual themselves. In training actors, it's a similar approach. I'm not a big fan of steamrollering in and saying, this is the process, this is what you should do. 
but rather taking more of a coaching approach and asking the question, what do you feel you need? And sometimes people don't know. It's hard to be objective about yourself. But my job then is to sift through my toy box and see if there's something I can dust off that can help you. And that could be in the external work, things like speech delivery, text analysis, craft work like voice and movement to more subtle internal work like meditation, mindfulness, personal growth, steadying nerves, confidence building, things of that nature. So we're pinpointing specifically where is your point of focus and I would suggest in that hour before it's you know stand and deliver and go time it may be external work that you personally need to focus on taking yourself off to the bathroom or a quiet space where you can run the material uh, looking at warming up your voice or applying some of the techniques that we'll have a look at in a moment. Again, a lot of that involves silly sounds and lots of movements. You'll want to take yourself off to a quiet spot. Or for many of us, myself included, it'll be more a case of steadying the nerves, being with the breath, grounding yourself and stepping forward with confidence. Either way, you're probably going to be in the bathroom. <laughs> So um, what specific tips do you have then for, for completely relaxing just before you step out? What, what, how do you get into that sort of zen-like mode? Mm -hmm. This is something I'm really passionate about. I've been a performer since about 10 years of age working professionally. So I was no stranger to a stage by the time I got to drama school, yet my experience at drama school and for a good 10 years afterwards was no short than torturous. I was just somebody for whatever reason that was wired in a way I didn't have the ability to be able to deal necessarily with anxiety or stress. And that was in every aspect of my life, not just in performance. I was constantly living in a, a baseline of worry, concern, dread and doubt amplified of course then when it's on stage and not to go into too much detail but things got much worse for me <laughs> before they got better which was good news for my students because it opened up this brand new body of work under the guidance of professionals looking at things like meditation, mindfulness, uh, personal growth. And I hated it. I was really resistant for a long time but eventually I had to yield and say mm, I feel better. I didn't feel good, but I felt better. And I, I, I started to sneak it into my practice with actors and they loved it. And then I brought it front and center. And it's been my joy of the last year or two to be invited to help drama schools uh, weave it into the way that we practice. So to sum that up, it would be meditate, uh, whatever that means to you. But again, I can offer some guidance in where to begin. Okay, so you've done that. You've put that first foot on the stage. Everybody's looking at you expectantly. You've now got to deliver that message. How should you stand? How? What, what should we do with our body? What should we do with our hands? Yes, the, the dreaded question of body language. The public speakers, actors, we get this question all the time or the statement of the second I open my mouth to speak, these things at the end of my body turn into some alien like tentacles. I'm just start doing weird things with my face. Am I doing too much? Am I doing too little? And I think the answer to that question may be slightly unsatisfying. My response would be to not think about it or to rather redirect your attention elsewhere. So as an actor, you're asking the question, who is my character speaking to? And from there, jumping off to what do I want to find an objective, an intention? And same rules apply again. Who is your audience? Who are you speaking to? What do you want them to feel? And what do you want them to leave this moment thinking about? And then with a little bit of guidance to distill that message down into one simple statement, like a mantra, that will colour and inform your delivery. And if you dial up the passion around that mantra, the verbal voice and non-verbal will work in perfect harmony with each other. The problem is, is that the skills around um, body language hacks are now pretty ubiquitous and we see them. We know when politicians are using the dread uh, thumb point, you know, where they're rolling up their sleeves. So uh, we have to start to be a little bit cleverer about our approach. Okay, so you're standing there, you've kind of squared yourself, you've, uh, you're going to show us some of these exercises in a minute, so I'm not going to give too much away. Um, but then how do you then think about projecting your voice? What is the difference perhaps between, you know, 
a good delivery and shouting because you're so nervous and you just want to deliver it as quickly as possible. I think there's a difference between um, pushing and projecting. Both pushing and projecting can be at the same volume level. We can be at eight out of 10. Pushing is working from tension. You're working from emotional, physical, mental tension in the body, in the breath. And so the sound is constricted and it's hard to listen to. Um, we need to tune the body, free the breath, so that the same volume feels pleasing to the ear. And from there, we can add in musicality, range, tone, things of that nature, which just makes it pleasing to listen to. Well, I think you're actually going to go back over some of those things that you taught, I talked about just then and teach us how to do some of them. So at this point, I'm just going to invite Joe to join us as well. He's um, just put his hand up as a, as, a, as a volunteer today. But, you know, with, with, with all seriousness, Joe is our latest recruit here at Alder, um, our account executive, and, and, and experiencing, you know, presenting to clients for the first time. So actually, this is going to be really valuable for you, Joe. So I'm going to leave you and in Alan's very capable hands, and let's see if you're a seasoned presenter at the end of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Welcome, Joe. Thanks for joining us and being very, very brave. Uh, could I start off just by asking you to give us a little base read, a little before, before the after. So for everybody at home, feel free to join in in these exercises once we get started. However, we're going to focus our attention on vocal craft. So rather than focusing on content, we've chosen a rather superficial piece of text so we can work solely vocally. So, Joe, if you're ready, over to you for our base read. I'll do the honours. So we're going to start with Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. He followed her to school one day, which was against the rule. It made the children laugh and play to see a lamb at school. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Profound stuff. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Joe just to step off camera for a little while while I talk you through the four main categories or components to our work. We start with the body. If you think about sound as being a journey, something that has to travel, the body is the vehicle that we have to tune up before we go. We can break the body down into two sub-compartments, which is everything from the neck down, what I refer to as the breathing body, comprised of the spine, ribs, shoulders, and hips, and then the speaking body, everything from the neck up. We'll get to that in a little moment. I'm going to invite Joe back on to camera now as we explore some of the body work. I'm going to join you. So... We're going to start off by looking at the spine. We're going to focus specifically on what we refer to as the thoracic spine, this upper back level joint to the shoulders. Now, a lot of these exercises are silly and childlike and playful. Uh, they are so for a reason. So try and dive in and have a go. We're going to start off just by, in slow motion, nodding the head up and down. We're releasing the breath, going a little bit further each time. We're not too concerned with taking the head back. We're more interested in this down mechanism. Joe, you stay forward. I'm going to stay, I'm going to turn to the side. So gradually, we're trying to get to the shoulders involved, going a little bit further each time. And then once we've hit the mid of the back, we're just going to slump over a little bit, a little bit like a, a stroppy teenager. And from here, we're just going to shake out the breath, shake out the arms, shake out some sound. So, how was your day, darlings? Stroppy teenager responds with a few grunts and moans. Lovely. And then we're going to hang over. And in a moment, Joe, I'll ask you to start to swing your arms forward three or four times, coming up a little bit further each time. So let's have a little swing. Swinging forward, swinging forward swinging forward and then coming all the way up nice and tall we're going to keep the roots nice and wide we're going to keep the trunk of the body nice and wide 
and we're going to widen the hands high and wide. From here, we're going to glue the hands to where they are. Hands don't move, but shoulders drop into the body so that we're strong in what we refer to as the back body. Feet are going to move into parallel if they're not there already. And keeping that trunk and that back nice and strong, we're going to start to lose our branches. And then we should have found a lovely sense of alignment. So from alignment, everything that's tall should be tall. And everything that can drop should drop, including the shoulders and the jaw, so that there is a suspended ease in all of that. How's that feeling, Joe? Good. I feel a lot more limber. <laughs> Fantastic. Wonderful, wonderful. Why don't we give the text another little run from there, then, from this place of suspended ears? Okay. Uh, Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Good. Fantastic. Now, for my ear, that already feels a little bit more ease and release. I'm going to ask you to step off camera for a moment as I talk about the next subcategory of the body, which is the speaking body. So we're referring here to the neck, specifically the sternocleidomastoid. I'll get to that in a minute. The jaw, the tongue and the vellum. The, the part in the back of your throat that you access when you yawn or when you're surprised, okay? So we're gonna to focus today just on the sternocleidomastoid, which is this stringy muscle that runs down the front of the neck. It's a really important muscle, one that we neglect, and one if you've ever spent any time on your phone, uh, lying down, sitting down in front of a television, this will get tight. If this is tight, it constricts the throat. So we're going to start off just by isolating and locating the sternocleidomastoid. If you just have a little wander around your collarbone, and then as your collarbone meets in the middle, you'll find these two little stringy tendons that are spearing away from them. And these muscles that are veering up towards your ears are your sternocleidomastoid. If you tuck your chin a little bit more here, you'll find that these muscles soften a little bit. So let's start off quite gormless in the face. And we're just going to gently become aware of the skin around the sternocleidomastoid, avoiding the temptation to jut the chin up because these will get tight. And that might be enough for you today. Keep going with that. Or if you feel a little bit braver, you can start to massage the muscle. It can sometimes feel a little bit achy. It can feel like a pleasantly unpleasant feeling. And that might be enough for you today. Or if you're feeling particularly brave, you can start to become curious about what's behind the muscle by gently scooping in and away and drawing it away from the neck. Having one last little squeeze at the top. Good. And then a nice little elevation to the back of the neck. We're going to test the range of motion just by having a little look over one shoulder and a look over the other shoulder. And even a little bit, little bit of work like that may feel it's a bit more easy. Uh, if you're working in front of a computer a lot, this is probably something you want to implement in, in intervals during your day just to keep all of this lovely stuff moving. So we're going to move on now to the second category, which is breath. If the body is the vehicle, the breath is the fuel. It's what we have to fill the tank up with before we go on our sound journey. I would break this down into two subcompartments again, starting with voice, acting, public speaking centric breath, which is practical breath or support. So I'm going to invite Joe back onto camera for us. Wonderful. So what I'm going to ask you to do, first of all, Joe, is to bring a hand and place it on your tummy. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to lower that hand to below the navel, right to the lower abdomen. Good. And then I'm going to ask you to bring another hand and place it gently on your chest. Wonderful. This hand is the greeter of the restaurant or the club. 
Hello, welcome, come on in. This hand is the bouncer. Your name's not down, you're not coming in. Okay. So what we want to do with our breathing, you stay facing forward, I'll turn to the side. As we're breathing in, we want to have a sense of the tummy springing away from the body. And as we breathe out, it comes home. You can have a few goes at that, Joe, as I speak. What we're trying to avoid doing is, as many of us do, breathing into the upper chest, what we refer to as shallow breathing. Most of us are doing this every day without being aware of it. Very simply, if we breathe into the upper chest, we are activating the sympathetic nervous system. It's very subtle and it tells us that there's something to worry about. When we access this lower abdominal breath, we cultivate the, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of our brain that tells us all is well and calm down. So now we're going to wake up the diaphragm from this lovely low abdominal breath. And we're just going to activ activate a little shush. shush. And the quality of that shush should be like putting baby to bed, as opposed to um, okay. a great librarian. Have a few goes at that for me, Joe. Good. Lovely. Could you just turn a little bit off camera because the shush is cutting out. The microphones don't like it. Lovely. Wonderful. Try that for me again. Gorgeous. And then just to wake up the diaphragm even further, we're just going to add in three pulses. Taking as many breaks as you need in between. Getting a little bit longer with the exhale each time, but avoiding running out of <gasps> breath. Wonderful, Joe. Thank you very much. You can step off camera for another moment. So that's the very beginnings of practical breath. From there, we would add a little bit of phonation and sound. And the name of the game is to enhance what we refer to as your, comp your capacity. My posh word for how long can you breathe out for. Always rooting it in this low abdominal breath. So we get an extra bonus point for being able to be calm in moments of crisis. That would take me then on to the second part of the breath work, which is non-actor, public speaking, voice centric, what I would refer to as the healing breath. So this is just begging, borrowing and stealing from the world of mindfulness, meditation, personal growth to allow you to be armed with a tool before it's go time to steady the nerves and build confidence. I'm gonna lead you now in a brief meditation um, feel free to join in. I would encourage that you do. I'm going to bring my fingers like this. Some people find that a bit weird enough. So if it makes you feel odd, then don't bother. But I will be doing that. I'll also in a moment be closing my eyes and I'll guide you in that as well. Wonderful. I'm going to start by tilting my eyes to the floor and allowing my eyes to go nice and foggy. I'm going to take in a nice deep breath in through the nose and out through the mouth. I'm going to enjoy the contact of my feet against the floor, enjoying the contact of my sit bones against the chair. And from this grounded, rooted position, I'm just going to build up through my spine finding that lovely balance between elongation and relaxation. And on the next inhale through the nose, I'll prepare myself to gently close the eyes on the exhale. If you prefer to leave your eyes open, feel free to do so, but do tilt them away from the screen. Good. There'll be moments of silence here. Nothing technical has happened. Enjoy the silence when it arrives. I'll ask you now to join me in relaxing the body. I'm going to count down from 10 to one. 
and you'll find a degree of relaxation and ease. You may even feel parts of the body start to tingle and buzz and all of that's wonderful. In 10, nine, going deeper, eight, seven, deeper still, six, relaxed and deeper at five, four, even deeper, three, two, and one, with eyes still closed. Bring your awareness to your body breathing naturally. And now start to breathe in gently through the nose over your own easy personal count of four. And out through the mouth for the count of six or eight. So we're breathing in for four and we're elongating the exhale over six or eight counts, whatever's easier. I'll invite you now to continue in that elongated breathing pattern as I speak, knowing that every time in life when we breathe in, we activate the sympathetic nervous system, the animal lizard part of our brain that says fight or flight or freeze, heart rate peaks, blood pressure rises. And every time we breathe out on the exhale, the opposite happens. Blood pressure settles. And the parasympathetic nervous system is activated, telling us that all is well. One more cycle of breath here with your elongated exhale. Before returning to your natural everyday breath. And in a moment, I'll count up from one to five. And when I get to five, your eyes will be open, you'll feel alert and energized and better than when we started. In one, two, thinking about opening the eyes, three, four, eyes beginning to open, and five, feeling alert and alive and awake and better than when we began. Good. Wonderful. Take a moment to settle. I'll go on and talk now about the third category, which is phonation. This is the bit where we actually get to make sound. The vehicle has had a little Krypton tune. The tank has been filled with petrol, and now we're ready to go on our journey. The first subcategory of phonation, as we discussed earlier, would be projection. So how do we discern, first of all, from projection and pushing? Now I'm going to invite Joe back onto the screen. Hi, Joe. Hi, yeah. Wonderful. So a little imagination game for you. Now a little bit of improv. I want you to imagine that you're in a pub or a bar. I don't know if you've ever uh, attended one, but I want Never. you to, of course, I want you to imagine there's somebody that you're trying to get their attention at a distance with just a simple, hey. Hey. Good. They didn't hear you. Go again. Hey! They still didn't hear you. Go again. Hey! Good. Lovely. So we found a lovely bit of volume there. Now, how do we keep that volume, but go from pushing into projection? Let's just change the imagination around it. Rather than in an irate way, you're trying to get the attention of somebody at a distance. Imagine you've seen a lifelong friend that you weren't expecting to see, and you're seeing them for the first time, but they're still across a crowded bar. How does that affect the hay? Hey! Good. Hey! hey. Good, one more time. Hey! Good, lovely. Try and ground the body a little bit more so we don't come up and out through the chest. And now let's see if we can use that same projection level, but using one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Good, lovely, fantastic. Um, we'll go on now, Joe, to look at the second category of phonation, which 
is musicality and tone. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to start to warm up your resonance and your range. How was your lip roll, Joe? Absolutely terrible. One of the least yeah. musical people ever. Yeah. <laughs> people do struggle with this. It's worth persevering with because it's a really lovely way to do resonance and range at the same time to get a lovely bit of tone and to get everything buzzing and in the front of the face. So just for today, let's just try one little chilli because it is cold outside. Good. And if that's not available to you today, we'll use a zzz. Z. Good, lovely. So we're going to use that Z now to go through every note in your register. We can start nice and medium. Good, just turn a little bit away from camera. So we, there you go. Lovely. And then we're just going to go a little bit further each time. Or whatever you can do with that. Easy. You're really, you're really putting the pressure on me. I am. I am sorry. We're here to not to play today. Uh, if at home you prefer to use a lip roll, you can use a anything that feels childish and kid-like. Okay, there we go. Good. Be a seven-year-old about it. Good. <laughs> lovely, lovely, lovely. I'll ask Joe to step off camera for a moment. So some of you may have engaged with some of these silly vocal exercises. You may have fun with them. You may hate them. You may roll your eyes. If I could sell you on the why, it would be this. Children are probably, without exception, the most present people on the planet. Children also tend not to have any problem with their voices for the most part. Uh, they can yell and scream and shout and scream bloody murder all day without ever damaging their voices. Yet as adults, we're often um, complaining about scratches and something feeling constricted or tight. So a lot of these exercises do feel childish and silly and maybe even asking the question, why am I bothering? We're really tapping into something a bit more primal and a bit more from the beginning. We are looking to invite Peter Pan home to Neverland. So we're opening up a bit of colour and musicality. If we're using more range through the voice, it's just more pleasing to listen to and people will listen to you at length much, much more. Uh, we can also then go on to look at a little bit of resonance, and that would involve simply having a nice little hum, mm, little Vix vapor rub into the chest, sending the hum very low down into the chest. We could also activate a little Tarzan. And either using that Vix vapor rub or that Tarzan, we can add in a little bit of of text. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, one, two, three, four, five. And then when I kill the exercise, I can explore what ghosts still haunt the house. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And for me, it just feels much easier in my body. It feels like things are freer. And we've created did that lovely world of projection, which is freedom and ease and volume all at the same time. We can move on now to the fourth category, which is clarity. The first subcompartment of clarity would be diction, articulation. Can I get my words out clearly? Can I get my mouth around the text? So uh, the old faithful would be a tongue twister here. Uh, before I invite Joe onto the screen, I'll just talk you and Joe through everything. So I love this personal tongue twister because it names all of the articulators, that is the parts of the body that are creating text. And they are the lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue, and then we're going to work backwards. The tip of the tongue, the teeth, the lips. So we're working from the lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue, the tip of the tongue, the teeth, the lips, the lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue, the tip of the tongue, the teeth, the lips. I'll invite Joe onto screen. 
Don't worry, Joe, I'm going to break this down for you. I won't ask you to launch straight in. Okay, so let's just do a call and answer. I'll say a phrase and then you'll say a phrase. Okay. So the lips. The lips. Can you really enjoy the difference between the P and the S? The lips. The lips. Good. The teeth. The teeth. Good. And really enjoy the difference between the T and the TH. The teeth. The teeth. The tip of the tongue. The tip of the tongue. Good. The tip of the tongue. Tip of the tongue. The teeth. The teeth. The lips. The lips. Good. Shall we try it all in one? So it goes like this. I'll just demonstrate once. The lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue, the tip of the tongue, the teeth, the lips. Give it a go. The lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue, the tip of the tongue, the teeth, the lips. Very good. So let's do that three times in a row. And we're going to failure like we would work at the gym. We're trying to fail. So I'll demonstrate once. We'll do three goes and getting quicker each time. So we would go the lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue, the tip of the tongue, the teeth, the lips, the lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue, the tip of the tongue, the teeth, the lips, the lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue, the tip of the tongue, the teeth, the lips. Maybe not as quick as that. <laughs> the lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue, the tip of the tongue, the, the teeth, the lips, the lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue, the tip of the tongue, the teeth, the lips, the lips, the teeth, the tip of the tongue, the tip of the tongue, the teeth, the lips. Well done. Very good. Jazz hands with Joe. Wonderful, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. I'll ask you to step off camera, Joe. Um, that's the last we'll see of you for this seminar. Thank you very much for participating. We would go then to the last sub category, which is clarity of message. So this takes us back to what I was discussing a little bit earlier. How do we, with a little bit of guidance, be very clear as to what our message is? Refining and again, who am I speaking to? What do I want the listener to hear? What do I want them to feel? What do I want them walking away from this experience thinking about? Refining that down to a clear message and using that to colour and inform your delivery. Thank you very much. That's everything from me this afternoon. I'll hand back over to Susan. That was just brilliant. Uh, I mean, what an, what an amazing skill to replace the fear of public speaking with the fun of public speaking. I mean, certainly I know that there are one or two things there that I'm going to take forward and prepare very differently in future. And I hope our audience at home as well got a couple of tips from that and will also prepare quite differently in future. And like to thank you for staying the course with us in what was quite a novel and quite a different uh, uh, webinar today. Um, and and, and I, as I say, I hope you've got something out of it. If you weren't able to follow along to the full extent and you would like the recording, then please do get in touch. Same as if you've also got a question for Aled, uh, that you would like specifically to, to, to know, because of, as he said at the beginning, this is very personal to individuals, hence us keeping the Q&A one-on-one -on -one today. If you have a personal question for Aled, please do message us and we will make sure that we uh, put you in touch with him so that you can have that one-on-one -on -one dialogue. But, uh, and, and thank you, as you just said to Joe, that was you know an enormous task to undertake, but did it absolutely brilliantly. And it was just great to see the, the, you know, the delivery change actually with each individual exercise. And I think that that's what's been so brilliant about today. So Aled, thanks again. Thank you everyone for, for joining us and we'll see you on the next webinar.